Good evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, good, e good evening. Um, my name is Paul Goldberger. Uh, tonight I am best known as one of the two writers of an introduction to Paul Vincent Wiseman's book. And it's a great pleasure to be here to celebrate this wonderful book, Inner Space, Inner Spaces, and more to the point, to celebrate Paul himself and to say a word about his work, which has been so beautifully documented in this book by the photographs of Matthew Millman and the commentary by Brian Coleman, a psychiatrist who has a second career as a writer on architecture and design, which leads me to wonder if I, as a writer on architecture and design, should consider a second career as a psychiatrist. <laughs> Actually, if anyone should consider a second career as a psychiatrist, or perhaps already has one, it is Paul Wiseman himself. <laughs> Since he knows, as all designers who, and architects who design private homes do, that if you are designing someone's house, you are embarking on a relationship with them that is as intimate, maybe even more intimate, than that of a therapist. Paul seems to handle that with extraordinary grace and understanding. Like a good therapist, Paul takes as his starting point who the client is, what he or she wants, and how their residence might become a supportive and pleasing backdrop for the life they choose to lead. He does not start a project by imposing a vision on his clients. Also like a therapist, he starts by listening and helps people to realize potential that was inside of them all along. Now that analogy can only take us so far, of course. Design is not psychotherapy, even if it can sometimes feel like that to all parties. <laughs> but what they do share, what they certainly do share in Paul's case, is the notion that the client is the starting point and that the professional is there to help the client understand what he or she wants, not to impose an external and arbitrary identity onto him or her. But the designer needs to bring more than just an ability to listen. You need a particular kind of eye, a particular kind of vision, a sense of composition, a sense of proportion, a sense of space and color and light, all things that Paul Wiseman has in spades. He's among the most sophisticated designers I know in terms of how he uses space. This is perhaps why he works so well with architects and they so enjoy working with him. He understands the spatial ideas that are often the starting point and he sees his job as reinforcing them, not as obscuring them or competing with them. I said in this book that in the hands of some designers, the road to elegance is often fraught with tension and often expresses that tension in a certain brittleness. Things have a look that you could describe as perfect, but perfect in a bloodless way. Paul Wiseman's work is not like that at all. It is never tense and it is never brittle. It is serene and relaxed. It is as elegant, in my view, as the work of any designer, but it's more understated than most. And the elegance always seems to look effortless. Maybe that's the most important thing of all, how well Paul makes it look easy and natural. That's how the most accomplished people are in every field, of course, the greatest baseball players, the greatest violinists, the greatest dancers, the greatest actors, all make it look like it has taken no effort. We know that isn't true and that there's a constant effort and a million challenges to be met along the way, but the most accomplished people feel that it is their job to hide the effort from us so that we see only the beautiful and natural result. So it is with Paul's work. When he combines abstract art and antiques, when he arranges the furniture in a room, 
when he brings differing patterns and colors together, when he mixes periods, he makes it all look as if it could not possibly be another way. It's natural and effortless and serene. We love the way the room feels, but we are not entirely sure how or why we feel as good as we do in it. That, I think, is how Paul wants it. He loves design as much as anyone I know, but he always sees design as the backdrop of a civilized life, not as an end in itself. Another way to put this might be to say that for Paul Weissman, life does not exist to serve design. Design exists to serve life. In Paul's hands, it does this job magnificently. So please join me now in welcoming Paul Vincent Weissman. Wow. <laughs> you, can, you can all go home now. That was enough. <laughs> I don't think I can top that. That's uh, pretty, pretty amazing, Paul. Thank you. Um, I'm um, eternally grateful for that kind of an introduction, as well as uh, his incredible forward, and Frank Gehry's forward, and Brian Coleman's amazing work, uh, Matthew's photography, and of course, uh, Stephanie and Carly Hobbs um, for your extraordinary um, um, location to have this uh, event in. Um, I've known Stephanie and Carly for probably 25 years, and in London and um, following them around and um, uh, it's a great pleasure to have all of you here in, in one of my, my sacred temples of, of, of where I find my very best things. Um, uh, so tonight um, I'm not going to give you a tour of the book. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our process. We're going to choose, go, going to um, talk uh, three projects and it's going to be about our process. Uh, because actually I think that's really uh, what it's about. Paul forgot one of my qualifications, not um, uh, psychotherapy, but I'm also a marriage counselor. <laughs> <laughs> and when it gets really tough, I just stand there and say, the shingle is up. Uh, so um, I need the, there it is. Um, the, so we're, we're going to, uh, by the way, this um, uh, image is one of my favorite images from the book. Uh, it, for me, it has a, a little more symbolism than what it actually is used for. Uh, the reality is it's the address for one of my projects in Hawaii. It's a Buddha hand we found in wood and cast in bronze, and the address is number five. <laughs> this, this, this sits at a front gate for a project on the big island of Hawaii. Um, I get to live a very creative life, and this is just one aspect of it. Um, but what I, what I wanted, before we get into the, the pretty pictures and talking about them, well, hello. Uh, <laughs> I've got, I've got a, a good audience here. Um, so so um, what, I, what I want to talk about a little bit, what, what, is, inter what, what is interior design? What, what is it that makes us so passionate about design? It is actually, for, for me, it, you know, it's just not a pretty room. It's, it's something that, that actually has a, a much deeper um, meaning for us. Our, our, our homes are probably the most, um, the deepest part of our psychic reflection. It's, it's who we are. Uh, when you take something home and you, it represents your outer world. It's an object that is a, um, has meaning. Uh, these are the this drawings of the caves, caves of Lascaux. Uh, they're some of the oldest drawings we know about our, our first interiors and our first architecture. Uh, the artists that spent thousands of years doing these art, uh, paid attention to their architect, which was the cave. These paintings are actually done on the contours of the cave. If any of you have been so blessed as to see it as I have, it is an extraordinary experience. Uh, the cave entrance is very small. It turns sharply and you enter these large caverns. It was one of the first places that they could go and be protected from the wild beasties that were, they were seeing in their outer world and they were representing on these walls. They created myths and stories to tell themselves what, what they were seeing, um, which we still do today. Uh, we paint landscapes, we put frames around them, we hang them on our walls. I always say the frames are like the opening of the cave. We find sacred objects, we bring them into our homes, and we contemplate what they are. 
Um, I believe that decoration is a, uh, like what the ancients called the long body of our memory. And we've gotten very sophisticated about it. And the things that we're going to look at tonight are actually our 21st century version of it. But I'd like you to try to remember what we're looking at and, and what it means in, the, in this ancient long body of our deep psychic uh, evolution. Um, we, uh, it's in our genes. Um, I, uh, I, I truly, oh, actually, I know one thing I want to remember. Um, I don't know whether any of you saw the uh, famous Herzog movie. I think it's Ca Cave of Dreams. It's about these Lascaux caves. And for years, the scientists had been bringing in their electric cameras and photographing the walls. And there's this one bison that has like 12 or 16 legs. And they could never figure out what the legs were for. And uh, fast by, I mean, uh, Herzog came in and lit a candle. And the flickering flame makes the legs move. It was the original video art. <laughs> and uh, we carry these genes in us. Uh, all, I, I believe that we are a collective organism. We are a manifestation of something. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the bowerbird. Uh, my dear, dear friend Harold Woltz over there knows all about them. <laughs> and uh, they, we carry about 60% of their DNA, but I think about 100% of their decorating DNA. <laughs> Andy Goldsworthy, eat your heart out. These male birds each makes a unique nest to attract the female. And they are, these are false perspectives, nests, they collect things like plastic bottle caps, color, to attract the mate. And the females bounce around from male to male's nest and check out the decorating before she chooses who to mate. <laughs> so things haven't changed much. So, so keep, this, keep this in mind as we move through our, our spaces. And, and I, I, I will try to remind you if I can as we go through. So part, part of this process are, uh, is, is the tribe. Um, I do not do this myself. I do this collectively with uh, my company called the Wiseman Group. Uh, we will be celebrating 35 years together in January. Uh, we're, we run we're approximately 30 people. Uh, my uh, principals are Brenda Mickel, Mauricio Munzo, and James Hunter, who are the, uh, Mauricio runs my architecture department, and Brenda and James are the senior designers that run the, uh, all the, the junior designers. Kevin Peters on the right is my CEO, CFO, who runs the company. Decorators are not good at finances, so they need one of those. So tonight we're going to walk through three projects. And one of the things I, in this collective process that I believe in is, is about architects. Um, so we're going to talk about my relationship with three architects and these three projects. Uh, I'm very blessed that two of the architects are actually in the audience. I, I frisk them for the rot, uh, rotten tomatoes so they can't throw anything. But um, we're going to talk about that, that relationship that you remember in the cave of Lusco, that they paid attention to the contours of the cave. When I, when I partner with an architect on a project, I have to hear what the story is. I want to know what, they, what the vision is. The clients become part of our team also. The landscape designer becomes part of the team. The best projects, we all are a team, that we work collectively. But the architect has the initial vision and then we all play off of that. And that's how we keep the carrot of design clean and pure, if we can, or eclectic or whatever it takes. But the best projects are when that relationship with the architect works. This first project we're going to look at is a 1920s Spanish style house in San Francisco that I had the great privilege of working with Richard Beard. Uh, he and I have worked together for over 10 years on various projects and have become very good friends over in that period. And uh, Richard had a great vision for this rather messy house. It really was that color. <laughs> and it was, of course, designated historic because it was in the right neighborhood and it was old, but it really didn't, <laughs> it didn't have a lot to do with how, how good a house it was. So they made us keep many of, many of the details, um, including the front door surround. But Richard's vision was, and our, our clients were um, uh, traditionalists at first with great antique collection and then had started moving into contemporary art. And these, the house was filled with a rabbit worn of rooms, the stair was in the wrong place. So we decided to gut the house and preserve it on the exterior in the simplest way possible. So this is the result of how it came out on the exterior, but you'll, you can still see the basic house is there. We passed, we passed the mustard with the city. Here at the front door, we left the surround, and then Richard started to introduce the, the contemporary setting for the, for the house. 
And as you, uh, when Brenda was in uh, Paris on one trip, she took, brought back a picture of a, a little lantern she had seen in a window. It was about this big, and we'd all looked at it and said, "Oh my God, that tells the story of the house. This this is a modernist lantern." And so we made our own version of it, and then made it the exterior light as well as an interior light. But it's still a a lantern, like an old house would have, but it's a modern lantern. And one of the things Richard did was, as he didn't lose track of what the house was, he didn't just say, I'm going to make a slick interior. So when you step into the house, this is the, the first main gallery. The, the floors are wood and marble, like a traditional house, the marble sur surround holding the wood floor. He removed all the moldings, but he did a reveal. So there's still an abstraction of, of a molding and a molding surround on the doors. The clients are uh, constantly changing their art, so the lighting system was designed to be totally flexible. Richard and I had been on a trip together with, I believe, I think it was the Sohn Museum or the ICA in, in London, and we were looking at a Robert Adams stairway, and he gave me a great lesson on architecture of how a cantilevered stairway is done. And they were done often with a six or nine foot deep stone wall, and, and each stair was stuck into the wall and cantilevered out. So in this project, Richard created a four-story four concrete a shaft that had stainless steel rods, and each one of these steps is a solid piece of stone that has a 16th inch clearance, and it actually suspended all the way through the house. And we worked together very closely to create this amazing uh, handrail. Uh, with codes today, it's very difficult to get a, a beautiful handrail, but this, we worked with our wonderful ca uh, bronze metal worker. These are all slightly tapered and uh, textured bronze and twisted at an angle to create this very elegant smoothness. And in a, in a way to keep the house also very human, instead of everything being new, we, we went through the client's antique collection and pulled the pieces of furniture that, that had a sculptural artistic quality these Swedish chairs from the 18th century, oops, I did it again, um, and covered them in an ostrich skin to bring them into the, uh, a more contemporary setting. And then we designed the uh, uh, bronze coffee table. Uh, even the fireplace, we had to leave the old existing fireplace in order to maintain a wooden fireplace, but we created a new surround for the fireplace in bronze with sliding recessed panels. Um, the attention to detail that, we, that you're often used to seeing in a very traditional interior still has to happen in a, in a contemporary interior. It's just a little more subtle. This, this custom ottoman uh, was all silk velvet, uh, hand embroidered in India, all in pieces and then reassembled in America. We designed the custom lamps. There are four of them in the room. The st uh, these cabinets on the, in the uh, living room actually hi uh, hide a very high-tech computerized stereo system that adjusts to the acoustics of the room and how many people are in the room, but it, we, we based it on a, a English design and a um, kind of slightly 40s Regency aesthetic. Here again, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know whether you're all familiar with the concept of wabi-sabi, but the Japanese are very uh, interested in how things disintegrate and the, and the beauty in something disintegrating as well as something integrating. So one of my passions is to use uh, objects that are, are ancient and old are falling apart, mixed with contemporary things that are new. And I think that's a, a, a way of reflecting the way life actually is. We're all um, expanding as well as <laughs> contracting and holding that, that tension. Here in this dining room, uh, it helps to have great, great art like this Gerhard Richter painting uh, with these 18th century uh, Italian chairs, and then the Wiseman Group designed a table design based on a Louis XVI table, but with a contemporary edge. And instead of using curtains for softness, we did upholstered panels on the wall. You can see the details. Um, so when, when I look at antique furniture, this is one of the reasons I love being here at Carlton Hobbs or, or at uh, H.M. Luther. Dan, Dan, I think you're here, my two, two favorite dealers in town, that they, they, they view objects from a sculptural point of view. Each piece of furniture for them is, is like a, a, a piece of art. And w when you play that with, with actual contemporary art, I think the whole thing works together. Uh, we created, a, again, referencing back to a traditional house. Traditional houses had wall sconces. So we designed a wall sconce that was contemporary in bronze, and then the this, this same sconce runs through the house. 
here the, um, uh, the attention to detail. These, these stools that sit in the entry gallery, as simple as they may appear, uh, simplicity is not easy. You, you have to get the saddle stitch to match the, the brushed chrome perfectly. I have a favorite New Yorker cartoon that I always show, to quote my clients, the, the decorators looking at the client holding the pen says, my dear, you can't afford simplicity. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, so, so as simple as it appears, it is, tr it is truly not. Uh, but, um, let's see. And this, this is the powder room. Uh, we've been experimenting a lot with this uh, new product called Galaxy Glass, where we, it, we actually laminate fabric between two pieces of glass. This is a, a, a mirror uh, with a linen stretched over it and then laminated uh, clear glass over it. So the entire room is, is actually mirrored behind fabric. And so you can sort of see yourself and it gives a dimension without being a true mirror. Here in the kitchen, there's our lamps again appearing in the interior version. Uh, this is a family room kitchen. And uh, when, when dealing with a, a very tailored interiors like this, we can't just put any furniture into the room. So in the sitting area that divides the room, um, I, I'm a firm believer that when you light a room, uh, we still have that ancient part of us that wants to have the campfire. That's why we like candlelight. That's why we all still want our fireplaces and lamplight. Uh, a translucent light that comes through a shade that actually shines on your face gives a warmth to a room that people really need. If you live in a very contemporary room that's all down light, you look like you're in a car sales showroom and you have bags under your eyes. <laughs> so you need to always balance the light. And so, but, but a, a lamp with a lamp shade sitting in a room like this would look silly. So we often design custom lighting fixtures that create that translucent light. And then you can, uh, the sofa is not just a big L-shaped sofa we actually make it very architectural. So we played off of Richard's architecture by creating this, the, the, the end table comes out of the sofa. This is a, a wooden back that runs the whole length that faces the dining area. The precision of fabric meeting wood, highly detailed. And the, the traditional concept of an exterior stone and an interior stone matching, uh, the limestone is a very ancient tradition, but cut in a modern pattern. San Francisco, unlike New York, where we have, our summers are very cold, we all have fire pits outside in order to be outside in the summer. Um, so the, this is an indoor-outdoor space. And even to the uh, master bedroom, we actually do have some curtains, but they are very, very tailored. Uh, the master bathroom references the traditional bathroom using Carrera marble, but in a very contemporary way. So living in this house, you're not removed from the reality of a, of a traditional house, yet, but you are brought into a modern time. Uh, one of the things that I'm fascinated about uh, where we're going with art right now, uh, if you've noticed, we're, not, we're no longer framing our paintings so much. When the Cubists came out, when the first abstract paintings, they still put traditional frames around them. Our canvases have gotten bigger, they've gotten frameless. We're moving into video art, which is in motion, back to the moving legs. Uh, we are in transition as, as a species. I think interior design is that most in intimate reflection of that. And so as you look at these images, remember that this is a constantly moving thing. Now this next project is very traditional. Uh, our clients loved England, loved cottages. Uh, this was a cottage built on a compound property that was actually designed as a library house for the clients. And they, they're in love, they were in love with Edwin Lutyens and Sir John Soane, and um, had the great privilege of working with Joel Barclay, your native New Yorker of I. Klegerman Barclay. Uh, Joel also is a, a divinely creative and very funny, and we've become very good friends after this project also. And as Joel pointed out, our client forced us to be our very best. And sometimes when a client really has demanding, and, and we, sometimes we know the answer and we give it to them first, but they, ma they make us go in a complete circle to show us every other possibility and come back to the very thing that we said to begin with, then they know that they got the best out of us. <laughs> Takes a long time, but it, <laughs> it, it's actually worth it. Uh, so this, this cottage, um, highly, highly detailed. Um, from the entrance that Joel, Joel designed, uh, we, found, we found this antique lantern 
which we felt, sometimes we find objects that kind of tell the story of a house. And this lantern was a wonderful, it has a slight oriental quality to it. It was still arts and crafts and feeling. So Joel created this amazing entrance um, and we hung the antique lantern here and then we created all the rest of the lanterns to go with it. We worked very closely with uh, P.E. Guerin here in New York to create all the hardware, all custom based on, on um, period designs. Um, many of the pieces in the house were, were purchased here at Hobbs. Um, a real eclectic mix. Our clients uh, love contemporary art. They love uh, antiquities from all periods. So fi finding things that actually went together was an extraordinary experience. Uh, Joel was a master at, at uh, manipulating the traditional idea. Um, we found this uh, uh, period Chippendale chair, which I've again viewed as sculpture. It sits there by itself. In order to make it feel important, we had it custom embroidered in India in the client's initials. But Joel created this seemingly simple molding. That is a very complicated molding. <laughs> <laughs> and we did many, many cuttings, as I recall, Joel, Joel to see until we got it right. But those, those are complex curves. And what they do is they reflect light and they create a frame. And it's at first, uh, first glance, it seems simple. But when you look at it, it's marvelously complex. Here in the living room, it's a, uh, it's a Lutchen's fireplace. We found the uh, Milton Avery painting has a wonderful juxtaposition with the Blue John accessories. Uh, here in the uh, living room, our client found this marvelous maquette. It's actually the maquette for a wall in the Boston Library. That's, that's the door. It was done in about 1912, I believe. And uh, this is a um, uh, astrological um, metal table that we found, and we said, we said that would make a great coffee table, but it didn't wasn't quite the right size. So we designed the leather and metal and wood stools to go around it to create the, the uh, extra seating as well as a coffee table. Attention to detail on, on every level uh, is extremely important for us. Um, what appears to be a, a sofa, chair, and rug is actually much more. This passementry was custom dyed to go with the, with the fabric and the carpet. The lampshades were custom smocked and the, and the cord was custom dyed to go with the entire room. These are subtleties that you don't see at first but totally reveal the room. This is act, uh, a, a real Lutchen's chandelier that Carly had found um, and Lutchen's had, had made, made reproductions of them, but the, the first, the original one, I think was, was done with real hunting fo uh, fox horns. And this table we'll talk about later. Uh, at the Wiseman Group, we love to do fireplaces, and uh, this, this is a custom grate with a Edwin Lutchen's circles and, and a custom uh, curtain. We really get into details. Grinley Gibbons was one of my favorite uh, carvers from the late 17th, early 18th century, and uh, no one's ever been able to top him. Uh, in terms of his, the dimension of his carvings. If any of you have ever see, seen his work, it's extraordinary. So my, my client also loved, loved the concept. And so when we got to the curtain hardware, she wanted Grinley Gibbons. <laughs> so this is as close as we could get. We worked with uh, Martin Zimmerman here at Point Six One Eight, and, and over in Brooklyn. And he for, did the drawings, found, did the carving, and this was the end result of the, more, probably the most elaborate drapery hardware we've ever done. Of course, the curtains were custom embroidered in India. Uh, this is us working with P.E. Guerin. I, I, I don't know how many of you know about P.E. Guerin, but if you don't, you should, all, you should try to visit it. It's one of your um, treasures of New York. It's down on Jane Street. They've been in business since 1850-something, and they've been in their same location since, I think, 1880 or something like that. There's no place on the planet like it. Um, it takes forever, um, but working with them uh, they, they, cut, they do wax castings for all their, all their work, and then the, it's all hand chased by incredible artisans, and the results are phenomenal. But it does take a long time. I've, I've, I've gotten so I tell people when we do, we do custom hardware like that, they have to read the fine print on my back of my card. It says it gets here when it gets here. <laughs> 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 because, <laughs> you know, and, and one, one of the things that, that to do very high-end decorating like we do, people have gotten so um, 
enamored with the internet and, and, and catalogs, and somehow they think they, that just because I have money, I can get it quickly. It doesn't work that way. Uh, we, do, we don't sell a product, we sell a process. And if you're really interested in the process, you can have this kind of a level of detail, but it, do, it just it is, isn't something that comes quickly. Here in this, this is one of my favorite uh, rooms. At first glance, it's, it looks like a library table in a library house with nice, pretty things. But actually, it's a, it's a very complex combination of, of periods and, and designs. It's a, a 19th century Sultanabad carpet, this beautiful aesthetic movement table that we found here at Hobbes that I, is a period that I've never been very fond of until I saw this table. Uh, these chairs are actually Regency period. They're probably from uh, Bermuda, so they have a very eccentric ivory back, very unusual design. These are Japanese bronzes. These are French fragments from a, a, a gilded statue. They're fl gilded flames. This is a Bugatti table. This is a, a Charles Pendergast screen. He was a very famous uh, uh, Boston uh, frame maker in America, probably the most famous. He only did three screens. My clients have two of them. And uh, this is Georgia O'Keeffe's very first flower painting. See, and, that, and these are French elephants with the Persian uh, vases. So it's, it, you, you can mix periods, but it's all about the quality and their sculptural value. Here's a close-up showing the relationship. I love the relationship of the relief uh, bronze here and the uh, uh, relief uh, gilding on the, on the Pendergast screen. Here's a close-up of that aesthetic table. Something I didn't notice until after we had finished the, the house, that this circular motion Edwin Lutyens used on much of his furniture, which we used in the house. These are the Lutyens chairs that he designed for the Viceroy's Palace in Delhi. And these wonderful uh, engravings are actually um, from a book that Carly found that there are actually drawings for uh, uh, an irrigation system and pumps but they became almost like modern abstract paintings. Here's one of the most difficult rooms Joel and I worked on. Our clients insisted on this marble, which was pretty wild. <laughs> and then we just said, well, what do we do with this? And so we worked with um, this marvelous uh, historic company in Detroit called Powabic Tile. Uh, they are actually on a national register uh, and, and they, make, they made all these tiles for us to incorporate and they matched the marble and this helped soften it and then this room was quite small and the, and, the, and the marble was very patterned. So we elevated the sections into uh, like paneling and used the marble like you would wood for framing. And it came out extraordinarily beautiful. Here in the uh, library of the library house, uh, uh, we found this beautiful uh, 19th century desk at Mallets and to try to find a wood that worked with it, we ended up using a witch elm, which is an unusual variety of elm, but we used my cabinet maker and finisher to do the room. So it's actually done like a piece of furniture, so it could complement the piece. Yeah. Da, da, da. <laughs> um, <laughs> timing. Um, then this is actually the powder room under, under the stairs. It is, it is really as narrow as it looks. It's only that wide, but we mirrored the, the walls, the Garin hardware, and that is actually the door hidden in the grill, grill of the mirrors. I give Joel full credit for figuring this one out. It was very difficult. Here, the, when we were at uh, Puabic Tile, we spent two days in Detroit. Um, the factory sits in the middle of the war zone of Detroit. It's really quite something with an armed guard watching. <laughs> and we, we were there and, and they made, they, our client said she loved ginkgo leaves and, the, and the art, one of the artisans disappeared for about half an hour and came out with a, a rough raw clay model of a, of a tile with a ginkgo on it. And we then laid out the pattern so that it, it looked like the ginkgos were blowing and built this pattern behind the stove. And then uh, Joel came up with this amazing stairway that he said he found in a, a, a Lutchen's cottage. And the, the stairs actually, you could flip it upside down, it's exactly the same both directions. Here are these beautiful steel, um, Stools that we found from, uh, from Mallet from the 19th century um, with a Lutyens period table. We even took the Lutyens designs under the skylights. But one of the things we do when we, when we find extraordinarily unique uh, uh, antiques, uh, I mean, what do, you, what do you put on a metal stool? So we found a suede, a, a gaufrage suede, 
with a plain suede bottom. So just, just that simple juncture and making it suede against the shine is how you keep, how you keep it human. Other, you know, if, it, if we put a silk on that, it would have been just way, way too much. Here in the bedroom was uh, Robert Kimes, the English uh, uh, decorator and, and fabric designer, um, introduced an incredible line of this uh, English chintz. And this is the, the chintz. We took the chintz and, and actually cut, cut it out and, and uh, it's called applique, where the, these are the pieces of the chintz and then they are tripuntoed, which means stuffed from underneath, and then we created the pattern on the headboard on this plain linen and then took the same pattern on the plain linen and tripuntoed it on the pillow. And you can see the legend's details here in the, the air conditioning ducts. So and the, with the Ushak rug with the beautiful blues and the antique um, fabrics, it appears very harmonious on the surface, but um, as Paul pointed out, it, it takes a lot of work to make it look simple. Here's the other, um, the other bedroom is another colorway of the same fabric taking the same concept. Here in one of the bathrooms, the Puavic tile again with the marble. Now in the top um, of the house, we, we were able to find room in the attic to create a little intimate office for our client. And we didn't, uh, uh, she loved this uh, Kimes fabric. And so we worked that uh, uh, from that. And we couldn't find a rug that worked. And so we brought in Vasaski. Ellen and Roger are here tonight. They're, I call them the, the priest and priestess of the, of the carpet world. And uh, they created a, a an arts and crafts aesthetic. That's actually a, like a cherry blossoms on a pattern carpet. It's very hard to see here, but it's extraordinary. I, I, if, you, if you're not familiar with Vysotsky carpets, they're kind of the, I, I call them the Persian rugs of our time. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make Ellen blush, but I always, in order to sell them to my clients, I tell them that the reason it takes so long and costs so much is that they're hand woven by virgin mermaids underwater in Puerto Rico. <laughs> I sell them every time. Here's, here's a, a shot of the exterior, what appears to be very comfortable and, and casual. Uh, this lantern is, our, uh, and these lanterns are, are the, the modern reproductions of that lantern you saw at the beginning. Joel worked out all the tile patterns, stone patterns, all the way up to the chimney, the lead windows. So one of the ways we do that is through mock-ups. So this lantern that seems casually placed on this stone was actually mocked up in, in wood with full-scale models so that we'd get all the wiring, all the everything to look very simple. Our client loves uh, garden ornaments and had a major collection of them. And so we, the whole house had to be designed so that we could accommodate antique garden ornaments. We took a, a trip to Spain to look at the influence of Islam on gardens. It's, it's a really tough life we have. <laughs> and, and one day in Granada, we were, it was very hot and we walked into this garden and there was an elevated pool and everyone was sitting on the edge with their hands in the water. And we realized oh, that's, that's the pool we want because it actually, in a hot climate like we, where we are, uh, sitting on the edge of water and just having your hand in it cools you down. And it, it was, so this was the interpretation of that. The columns um, are actually based on columns from Stanford University. My clients are very involved with the, with the university. And oh, actually, I forgot one thing. Those garden chairs, um, we found an antique chair somewhere and we showed, I showed John Danzer a picture and of course, John Danzer is here tonight too, I think, of Munder Skiles Furniture. And John found the catalog from 1830 something with where the chairs were originally from and he reproduced them for us for the whole property. Uh, we went to England and, and fell in love with uh, Lutchen's garden and Gertrude Jekyll and Lutchen's did this famous garden at Hester Coombe and this fountain, is, which is a double half dome of itself, Joel was able to reproduce perfectly for the garden. Okay, now this next project, we, another world, we're going to fly off to Hawaii. I had the great privilege um, of working on four projects with uh, the Mexican architect, Ricardo Legareta. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, and uh, to my, he, uh, he became a very good friend and um, extraordinary man. He was uh, Luis Barragan's protege. Uh, Luis Barragan was the first kind of a Latin American modernist and uh, Ricardo was very shy of decorators. In the first house we did in Maui, he wasn't so sure, but he, uh, once he realized that I actually was listening to him, uh, by the time we got to this house, uh, this is my oldest clients, and we had an extraordinary team effort. So Ricardo's architecture is extremely specific. Uh, he has um, languages that he uses over and over again in various ways, but they're, they're always 
the way he wants it. So every piece of furniture, everything we did with this project, um, we worked with him and had him approve it because I didn't want to go against um, the, the aesthetic. So this house is right on the coast. Of, um, I don't know if any of you know the Big Island, uh, the Mauna Kea Resort is only a five minute walk from the front of the house. It's a, a very unusual design for Hawaii. Nothing's ever been done quite like this, uh, but we used all native Hawaiian plants. This is the inner courtyard. Ricardo uses very strong colors. Uh, so we were able to find the, actually, the same purple excuse me, uh, color uh, of his, one of his inserts to make the cushions. Excuse me. Um, we went on a, another one of these um, terrible buying trips we had to go on for three weeks to study tropical lifestyle in Indonesia <laughs> and buy beautiful things for this house. And I, I took my clients to all the Amman hotels, which are my favorite hotels in the world, and we stayed in historic places and bought a lot of antiquities because they knew that they wanted a balance of old and new, and they're, they're great art collectors, and they were going to have this very contemporary house. And so we, uh, we bought many, many artifacts and brought them back, and uh, including these um, extraordinary screens. These are a Ming period. They're the end panels from a palace screen. They're 12 feet tall, and these were actually abstractions of mountains in gold leaf. These are 500 years old. And, but they take on a contemporary feeling. Uh, we laid out the entire room in mock-up form, which I'll show you in a minute, and, and to, to, it's a very large room, and so it's, it's hard to create intimacy. This is a bronze coffee table with leather and movable trays, so many people can sit on the ottoman or set your drink. And one day we did our mock-ups and went away to lunch and came back and found the contractors. All <laughs> and they were using the living room exactly the way we wanted them to. <laughs> So it was, my clients were convinced that this, is, this is the, was the right scale and the right plan. And, um, here, and oftentimes dining rooms, are, I, I, I have a thing against dining rooms where they often look like conference rooms. And so here we, we designed a table that is based on Legareta's triangular uh, columns. Uh, that act, these, these are solid teak. They're actually anchored into the concrete, and they come through the solid teak tops, creating the pattern on the top. And they're in three sections, but we leave four chairs all the time, and then you can add a leaf, and it becomes a table for eight, and add another leaf, a table for 20. But the, these become the uh, artifacts tables in this very large room. Here in the uh, media room, uh, this sofa is actually almost 15 feet long, but it, uh, we designed it to feel like it was part of, part of the architecture. And the same with the kitchen. This kind of precision was very difficult when we're working 2,000 miles away. The, the, the house was being built and the floor intersections were here and our, our sofa had to come from San Francisco and fit perfectly. Here in the uh, kitchen sitting here, that's the so other direction. Uh, we found these marvelous um, spice rack boxes which reminded us of the grids of Lake Aretta, but, uh, but were antiques. And then the clean lines and then the mo wonderful modern art like this Martin Purrier wood sculpture. Kitchen, again, very simple. Um, Legoretta did not do kitchens, so this is why I have an architecture department, because sometimes the architects cannot do what we want them to do, so we have to do it. Not you guys, though, of course. So there, there, are, there are great architects that I don't have to fill in the gaps for, so it's, which is my favorite way to work. Here again, the furniture was designed custom for the house with the horizontal lines. Uh, we often do um, outdoor furniture, a lot of furniture, only once for our clients. Uh, our clients do not want to see their furniture in someone else's house. So uh, it takes a lot more time, but um, uh, it, I, I think, again, it reflects back to the, um, the, the deep psyche. You know, we, we, are un we, we, we like to think we're unique, and when everybody has a ubiquitous interior that they all bought at Restoration Hardware, you lose your uniqueness. <laughs> And so I think people really are, 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 that's why I think we love art and objects and particularly antiques to, and contemporary art because that holds that unique reflection for ourselves. Here are these, uh, these, this is a stairway up to a guest bedroom and this goes into the master bath. Again, I, I found these uh, marvelous um, African chairs to create a primitive sculpture against the clean lines. This is my favorite room. This is uh, uh, Ricardo and I used to fight over this bedroom. Who is my bedroom? No, it's my bedroom. But this is the um, guest bedroom, believe it or not. Um, 
and it floats in a, in a pool, a courtyard of water of 18 inches, and there's a stone chaise floating out here. You can step out the window into the water. And through this, through this slit here, you walk into the, the bathroom. Also, we designed uh, a custom lighting fixture to go with the house. Uh, this was the angle of the roof, and we used the same radius on our lamp. Ricardo liked it so much, he bought three for himself. Here's some of the angle. This is that slit that goes from the courtyard into the, this is the outdoor shower. I always say Hawaiians, unlike the rest of us, were born naked. And so this is a view of how it works with the courtyard, the master bedroom. There's the, there's the lamps in situ. Uh, this headboard was designed with, with Ricardo. It's actually a room divider as well as a headboard. Uh, it's about a foot and a half deep, and that's all red lacquer inside the slots. And so when the light moves through it, it, it reflects the red. Again, mixing objects from, of antiquity and modern. Uh, this is a modern Ikebana basket mixed with the um, Thai sculpture, the Buddha heads and the grid. The master bath is all Mexican travertine. And uh, this was that purple wall that you saw in the earlier picture. You step out here and you move to the lap pool. And this is a 75-foot two-lane lap pool. Uh, Ricardo gets full credit for this one. It's amazing. And during the day, all the reflections change constantly. But uh, in the tropical sun, the shadow moves over so you can swim midday. This is one of my favorite pictures that tells the whole story of, how the, of the relationship of the interior design with the architecture, where you see the curves of the roofs, the slats, horizontal, vertical, the antiquities, the new objects. Uh, we designed these lanterns and had them made in Bali. There are about 30 of them throughout the house. They're actually carved in stone in the Legoretic grid. Uh, this is one of my favorite seating areas we'll go to in a moment. Here's a close-up of the, the chairs, the, the spa. It's, a, it's an amazing location. Uh, this, is, this is a seating area that we designed for the house. Um, a lot of times these big projects can end up looking like hotels and too much furniture. And I'm, I'm very interested in how people gather and interact. So they, these are actually tete-a-tete -tete chairs. That, uh, you can sit 12 people in that setting, but it, from a distance, it, doesn't, it looks like three chairs. And so people sit both directions, and the clients uh, light, light the candles at night. The ocean is crashing below. The relationship of the vertical, vertical slats with the relationship with the um, columns Remember the cave and its relationship with the art, the haunches of the, of, the, of the animal. So it's very important in design and in particular the way we look at it, the Wiseman Group, that we relate back to our architect and, and the location. So people often ask, you know, the, this is the, the cover of the, the book. Uh, people often ask, you know, um, what's your favorite project? I've, I've been blessed with so many extraordinary projects, but I, I like to quote uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, when asked the same question, uh, what's your favorite project? And he said, the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm actually want to stay up here so I can answer any questions. Anybody got any? Don't, don't be shy. Yes? Was that last set of chairs that formed the tetra-tet, um, was that a no, uh, The question is, was the, the circle chairs, was that a Munderskiles design? No, it was not. That was a Wiseman Group design. Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we, we designed that for the clients. Um, Thank you. And it's, uh, we, we've done another version in the grid for another client. It's a, it's a great way, especially in the tropics, where you, you want intimacy when you're under the stars. It creates a sense of, of being contained, yet the air moves through it. Because if you're just sitting out under the stars, it's too big. You, it, it actually holds you. Anybody else? Yes? It's on the peninsula. Asking about the cottage, the Cotswold Cottage House, that was actually down the peninsula uh, uh, near in Palo Alto. Uh, the other one's in, in San Francisco, yes. Anyone else? Yes? Ah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
That, that question came from my, my best friend since we were eight. <laughs> His house is in the book. Um, the question was, is it true I can drive a tractor and a tin wheel truck? Yes. <laughs> I, I grew up on a farm and um, I, I, I was very good at counting rows, as my father said. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Yes. When, um, what part of the design do you feel that you need to change to do a mock-up? When, when, when do we decide to do a mock-up? Well, it depends on the client. And, and sometimes uh, the question is, when, when do you decide to do a mock-up? Um, it, it depends on how complex the issue is. Um, like that living room, uh, it, it was a very large room. And the clients did not understand that the furniture needed to be as big as it needed to be, and they were very skeptical. And, and they, but they wanted to be able to sit two people to 15 people. And so I, I said, all right, let's do it in plywood. And, and so it, and it sort of kind of depends on how visual the client is also. And, some, and sometimes, for, sometimes we get it so out there, we're, we're not sure. And so we do, we do the mock-up for ourselves too, as visual as we are. It's a good question, thank you. Anyone else? Ta -da. Okay, well then you can all go down and enjoy the rest of the house and, and the party. And we have books here for you to, uh, uh, the booksellers here, and enjoy yourself. It's a wonderful building. Thank you. Thank you.